The climate crisis can feel hopeless and depressing, yet there are perspectives that allow us to view it in fresh, more hopeful ways. This next session looks precisely at that. To introduce this session and the speakers, I would like to invite Mr. Benedict Parmanand on stage. Mr. Benedict is not only the founder of GLF, but is also uh, the founder of an online magazine and platform, SustainablyNext.in, and the Bangalore Business Digital Festival that is celebrated its eighth edition this September. The floor is all yours, Mr. Benedict. Thank you. Can I invite uh, Mr. Malik Masood, CEO of uh, uh, RE Sustainability? Please give him a big hand. Can I uh, invite Avi Vanik? He's an ecologist with ATRI. Theme of our session, hope amidst gloom. I'm sure you must be wondering, it could be a trick theme. Because going by the news reports, going by media and climate crisis everywhere, I'm sure most of you think that there is no hope for the earth. So here's a quick poll uh, with the audience. How many of you think that the earth will go extinct in the next hundred years, or humanity will perish in the next hundred years. How many of you think? How many? Raise your hand if you're confident. I can see six, seven, eight, ten, eleven. <laughs> okay. Uh, how many of you think that uh, in the next fifty to hundred years we will reclaim? We will heal the earth, we will get the earth back. How many of you think? Wow, that's optimism. So I'm quite happy that I coined this uh, theme of this session as hope amidst gloom. But there's a lot of work to do. Not just a lot, plenty, plenty of work to do. That's why I got the experts, the eminent experts, uh, to come and uh, speak and share their uh, uh, experiences here. But what made me choose this theme? Many of you may not know that Green Literature Festival is an initiative of Sustainability Next magazine. We covered this story in October. People almost wrote off that orangutans are going to become extinct in uh, Indonesia. But there was an initiative, a government, private sector, bankers, funding. In 2016, they raised $90 million. And within two years, they reclaimed the, or some 44,000 hectares of land in uh, Indonesia, and orangutans are happy. So they have restored. So why did I share this story? It's a story of hope. Okay, then there's the next. Okay, this is by far the biggest uh, positive story we have ever known. I think in, uh, we remember in 80s and 90s, we have been told that we are going to have a huge hole in, the, in our atmosphere and we all are going to die of cancer. That's because the spray that we used to use, we still use the uh, deodorant and also this chemical called CFC, chlorofluorocarbon, that is used in all refrigeration. The hole was getting bigger and bigger. Two decades, nobody knew what would happen. But then a company, was it Bosch? Some company found, a, DuPont, DuPont found a solution and not just that, all the governments, all the organizations got together and we, today we see 2019, the hole has become much smaller and today scientists are claiming that it is going to be closed in the next uh, five to 10 years. So that's a huge, huge achievement and that's the testimony for hope. So there are hundreds of such stories. So it's good that we look at hope the stories of hope, and Mega was saying that 
GLF is nothing but a storytelling platform. How do you tell, may, rather, how do you bring about change through stories? And these are the stories uh, that we try to do as interesting as possible. So uh, I'd like to now play a short video of my hero, hero Paul Hawken. Uh, he's an entrepreneur and uh, activist. Uh, two of his books have made a huge difference and he's reframed the whole narrative of, uh, of climate change. So according to him, in the next 50 years, in one generation that is, we can reclaim the earth and we can reclaim it with the technologies we already have and with the models we already have. We just have to look out for it and go and do it. Okay, Let, let's enjoy this. Um, went around for years and saying, kind of like Diogenes, looking for a wise institution and to see, can we just make a list of what we know how to do that we, is at hand, we know how to do, we have the technology, the engineering, the practice, and we can measure the cost, you know, we, we need that. And no one did it, and so in 2013, long story, I, I decided to do it. I, got, I didn't know how to do it either, by the way. They asked me to do it. I said, if I knew how to do it, I wouldn't be asking you. And so we got a bunch of people together, and we figured it out. Okay, that's Drawdown. But the interesting thing about that, as Drawdown was published in 2017, and then Regeneration is the sequel to that, um, the languaging around climate became more acute, I would say. In 2016, when Drawdown came out, Penguin, my publisher of 30 years, said, uh, climate books don't sell, we don't want to really publish this book. It's my editor. I said, where's your loyalty? You know, and, uh, and he said, well, it's paper bound, that means the, you know, it won't be reviewed. You know, New York Times only does hardbound books. They don't do paper bound books. Ah, oh, thanks. And, uh, uh, and it's in color, very expensive. 100% post-consumer waste paper. Do you know how expensive that is? Uh, I mean, they had all these reasons why they didn't want to publish it. And it was long, it went on for a year. People were equivocal about it and this and that. And finally, it was Catherine Court, the publisher. God bless her, she's an amazing woman. They had one more meeting where everybody's going, mm, 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 maybe production, promotion, this, that, you know, all being very equivocal about not saying no, not saying yes, and so forth. And she said, at the end of the meeting, said, may I ask one question? Which is like she's the CEO, you know? And I said, yeah. And she said, tell me, if we don't publish this book, why are we here at all? Boom, bingo, right? We can ask that question of ourselves every day. Why are we here at all, given where things are? Now, if you're hoping that I will give a speech that's hopeful, you're out of luck. If you're <laughs> hoping I give a talk that's about fear and in lo loathing and terror, you're out of luck as well, okay? I'm not gonna go there. I wanna go someplace else, you know? And I want to go to the way we talk about it. Because in the language that we use around climate is something that we know very well as individuals, uh, which is a sense of separation. They say that we wake up 10 times a night. We don't remember it. But we're scanning, our brain's scanning for threat. It makes sense, you know, going back 20, 30, 40,000, 50,000 years sleeping outside, who knows? I don't know, the brain's wired that way. But whether we remember that at night or it just happens in the morning, it happens to us all the time because that part of the brain is so powerful. And we look, am I good enough? Did I dress right? Do people approve of me? Am I, you know, I mean, you know all the questions, we're all that way. Right? But all of that is egoic, of course, it's about I'm separate self. And so when we look at the climate crisis, it's very difficult not to look at it from that individuated point of view. It's just, we're wired that way, okay. 
And so the language is created by men. With all due respect to Catherine Hayhoe, not some of the great women scientists, the men created the language. Combating, tackling, fighting, mitigating. I mean, who wakes up in the morning and says, I can't wait to get up and mitigate? I mean, the point, <laughs> you know. But embedded in that language is othering. Every woman here knows about othering, OK? Right? Yeah. Yep, absolutely, you know, since you were little. And, but othering is like the climate. We're going to fight the climate. climate. Where is the climate? Where is it? Oh. You know, and the idea that the biosphere and the atmosphere are two different things, where did that come from? They're the same thing. We have a gas, and we have matter. We're one being. The Earth is one thing, you know? And so this idea that we're going to go tackle, fight, and mitigate, or whatever, climate, and it's, oh, it's in, one more thing, climate change. We're going to fight climate change. Well, the climate changes every nanosecond, OK? It's supposed to change. You know, the Earth changes its axis and all that sort of stuff. And there's currents in the oceans and temperature changes in the air and so forth. And it creates what? Strawberries, grizzly bears, rivers, glaciers, salmon, <laughs> popcorn, <laughs> dragonflies. The change in climate causes changes that allow life to become what it is today. So that fact, trying to fight change, good luck. So we're fighting something that shouldn't be fought. But not only that, we have separated ourselves, separated ourselves. And, you know, and so from my point of view, the reason to write regeneration is the word itself, right? And if you look at how we've approached it, I want to go to people and say, how is this working for you? I don't know who to go to. Because 98% of humanity is disengaged, is not doing anything. After 45 years of climate being in the public sphere, 98% of people aren't doing anything. Now, half of them know full well that it's coming, what the causes are, roughly or in detail. But they still aren't doing anything. So why could that be? And I don't blame people. I'm not pointing my finger. I'm just saying, could it have something to do with the way we language, the way we talk to each other, the way we connect? Because the language we're using is profoundly disconnecting. Right? So the way you heal a system, any system, immune system, ecosystem, social system, is to connect more of it to itself. And that requires a very different mind state than the one of being a climate hero, I'm going to fight, I'm going to go out to do this, and so forth. I'm not decrying any activists that are out there and doing stuff. Bring it on. It's fantastic. But on a larger level, we're not engaged. I'm not speaking on behalf of you. I'm just saying the bigger we. We're not doing it. And it shows. So what can we do? And to me, regeneration is not about being right. It's not about trying to change people's minds, because you can't, if you notice that. <laughs> it's hard enough to change your own mind. So what are you going to do, change everybody else's mind? Not likely, right? So really, it's about creating the conditions for self-organization, creating the conditions in which people can change their own mind. And so regeneration, I easily could have, when I was writing it, said at the beginning, it's all connected. Yeah? It's true. It's trite. It's, <laughs> it's cool. It's a cliche. It's like, yeah, thank you for sharing. I mean, instead, what I tried to do is make connections that are more like, who knew? You know, like who knew a dragonfly only lives for one month, but actually in the air, but five years underwater, you know? And that they have 24,000 um, cornea, and they can see up, down, sideways. They can see in all directions at all times. Isn't that weird? Can you imagine having 24? You have two. 
uh, 24,000 cornea, and you're flying around going, <laughs> what do you see? What is it thinking, you know? I mean, who knows, you know, and so forth. But to create a sense of fascination about this extraordinary miracle we live on, this planet called Earth and who we are, right? And so that somebody reading the book might come to the point where they go, wow, it's all connected, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but they have changed their own mind. And so what are those conditions? What do we need to do in order to, for that to happen? Well, it's very different than what we have done because when climate first came out in the public sphere, it was very much about future existential threat. You've heard that many, many times. That's what science said, and that threat is causes fear, okay? Got it. Activists took that up, and then they went to shame, guilt, and blame, right? Of course, you know, fossil fuel companies, Chevron, Exxon, this, that, cars, GM, I mean, there's lots of potential <laughs> targets, right? And basically, threat, fear, shame, blame, guilt, stir well, what do you have? You have people just shutting right down. Of course. And what hasn't been properly explicated and shared is that every problem, every problem is a solution in disguise or it would not be a problem. How can it be a problem unless there's a solution? The moon is not a problem. <laughs> Moonlight's not a problem. <laughs> I mean, there's so many things that just are, and we don't think of them as problems, you know. We may not like them even. Right? So when we look at the possibilities, it's a very different way of I think um, those of you who are looking, are uh, hoping to get, you know, the solution, the pearls of wisdom, um, won't happen. I think what I'm about to share with you are a few questions that are there in my mind. The, I believe that the answer is yet to be written. But let me just start by having a conversation with some of you. And let's take stock of where we are at the moment. We just heard that the basic problem, that at least from a climate standpoint, uh, is that 98% of us, or X percent, a very large percentage of us are not really connected with it. So let's, let's try to connect ourselves a little bit to that challenge. Let's look at this building. Yeah? This, this fantastic, lovely space that we are all in. And let's, let's think about its life cycle. So, uh, about the footprint, the carbon footprint of this building, where do you think it is? What is driving the carbon footprint and therefore the climate impact in one way or another associated with this building that we are collectively inhabiting today? Just, just some quick off the cuff responses. What do you think drives that? What is driving the carbon footprint of this building? Energy, <coughs> Energy consumption. Waste. Sorry? Fantastic. About half of the life cycle emissions of this building was fixed the day it was constructed. Thank you very much. We, to solve a problem, we should understand a problem. If we do not know where the carbon is coming from, we cannot really mitigate it. And therefore, it becomes somebody else's issue, Exxon's issue. Shell's issue, not my issue. Half of the life cycle climate impact of this building is in the materials. It's called embodied carbon. So friends, one of the concepts I wanted to share with all of you is that shared responsibility that each one of us has in this response, the healing that was being talked about. And that is in the materials that surround us, embodied carbon. 
and if we make choices around those materials in an interesting way in an innovative way in a new way it creates opportunities opportunities not just for healing but believe it or not for creating economic value and i'm lucky enough to be in a business in a profession which does exactly that we make money we create economic value from something that is traditionally being considered as waste and the two ways to look at it so very quickly one lens i think we talked about the the previous uh, session was on the intersection of art and science right i mean the, the, we heard some amazing filmmakers talk about their 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 perspectives this business of 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 trying to find value in materials beyond their traditional life what is traditionally known as a waste is the intersection of actually science and economics it's that intersection so making good choices there and really understanding the economics well is key one very quick example and another question back to you this is a pop quiz session um one of the ways that you can reduce your carbon footprint what is top of mind what is top of mind to all you any the the the, the scientists here or the or the, the activists here or the students here what is top of mind when i say your carbon footprint how can you reduce it what can you do to reduce it excellent example jute bags yeah and an example where i mean clearly there is a there is there is there is science in what you answered there are great intentions good intentions that don't necessarily translate into good science so one very quick example i wanted to make a friend of mine recently told me i went i'm i've gone green i just bought an electric car so i said okay great fantastic you bought an electric car yeah that's 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 fantastic uh, yeah i mean how is that going green he says oh well i won't use you know pet petrol anymore i'll not use a fossil fuel anymore i'll use electricity and i said that's not fossil where is it coming from so exactly so the life cycle so beyond the embodied carbon lesson that i learned which created this opportunity to create value from waste is the life cycle carbon footprint aspect you go beyond the instant and look at the life cycle of your decisions and understand what is more sustainable so uh, we'll take a break there uh, masood uh, <clears throat> i mean you will be really surprised to know that uh, masood represents a company which uh, recycles 15 now uh, they recycle 15 uh, different elements uh, waste into value in india the latest they have set up is uh, uh, recycling e waste and to get precious metals like gold and uh, platinum out of it in hyderabad that's one of its kind in asia and the company he represents is uh, unicorn three times which nobody very few of us very few of us know uh, so thanks for being here uh, making your time and he was the first to arrive today <laughs> yeah i i have questions for you later i'll come to uh, dr abhi wanak he has amazing stories uh, he's uh, specialized he specializes in uh, animal movement ecology disease ecology savanna ecosystems and wildlife in human dominated systems but please structure this in a way because the theme is about hope and uh, tell us that how your research has i mean people reading here the students can hope for a better future from the research that you've done thanks um thanks for having me here uh, benedict and uh, unfortunately uh, harini is not here yeah. um and so i should have announced that uh, uh, she has a bad throat she couldn't even speak on the phone so yeah. she sent her apologies and so yeah apologies also from our side for being a manual um, you know 
and subjecting you to it. Because, you know, even, uh, even the speaker up there was talking about the, the, the absence of women in the public dis discourse and how most of the, the words or the definitions or the, or the language is from, from the male side, and that's a problem. Um, but, you know, when, when we're talking about this topic of hope and gloom, um, this is all the gloom, and that's the hope there, especially the younger children. Um, and I know it sounds very trite and it sounds um, corny almost, but the fact is that you know we are we are entering a period of time which is going to be very challenging for us as humanity. Uh, he asked a question, you know, will humanity survive a hundred years? You know, humanity may survive ten thousand, maybe even a million years, but a million years like this in evolutionary time scale. It's nothing in the scale of the Earth. The Earth itself will continue to go on. Life will continue to go on on Earth, as it did before humans came on. And it will probably be, probably be just as diverse as it, as, as it has been in the past or is, is now. It you know, will probably miss us. So what, what is it that we are trying to capture? What, are we, what is it that we are trying to fight for now? It's, we are fighting for our own existence. We are fighting for our idea of life on Earth. Because, you know, and, and that's changing with every generation. Um, you know, my generation had fewer people to deal with. Bangalore was not, you know, even just 10 years ago, Bangalore was not such a large city. Uh, 20 years ago when I first used to work in Bangalore, going beyond Hebal was out there. It was wilderness and now it's, you know, it's part of the city. So the earth is changing, our cities are changing at a rapid pace. And so what you see as, as the current present is very different from the past and is going to be very different going forward. So what is it that we can do now to not reverse these changes but to slow some of them down and in some places reverse them? So this is what I wanted to present today which brings together some of the things that I work on. Um, I work on savanna ecosystems. Did you know that India has savannas? Children here, did you, did you know that, you know, where, where are savannas? Huh? Somebody mentioned Hasar, yes, Hasargatta. But when you, you hear, hear the word savanna, where do you think? Africa. Africa. You never think that India has savannas, but India has vast savannas. And it's got species that live in these savannas. And not just that, people depend on these savannas. Our previous panel here was talking about uh, um, Chalakere. It's a beautiful savanna ecosystem, which unfortunately, because of a British colonial legacy, was labeled as a wasteland. And, and vast areas in India, which are important habitats, which are not forested, are also labeled as wastelands. And most of these um, are what we call open natural ecosystems. So they're not necessarily forested. When we think of nature, we always think of trees, but grass, rocks, Sand, water, these are also part of nature. And what we are trying to do is reclaim the dialogue around some of them. Um, take some of this back and say this is also important for us. Because not just wildlife, not just um, millions of, or definitely ten, tens of thousands of species depend on it, but humans depend on it. And I think nowhere in the world does the cultural, biological, and social connect between humans and nature happen more than in India. We are one point, almost 1.4 billion people now. And we still have large carnivores. You know, we still have lions and tigers and leopards and, and large wildlife like elephants in our midst. Europe lost most of their large animals. America went and destroyed most of its wildlife. And they're only a fraction of the population that we are. But we didn't. We found a way of living with them. And that's where the hope comes from. The hope comes because, and this is where I also, you know, he said I study movement ecology. I study how animals learn to live with humans. But what I find though is that humans are increasingly not, are unlearning how to live with those animals. Just as animals are starting to le learn to live with humans, because humans are everywhere, there is an increasing disconnect. People have stopped 
um, understanding how to live with animals around them. So this is something we want to change because he was also mentioning we are becoming disconnected from nature. Um, and in India, we cannot afford to do that. We are, it's nature is all around us. There's a couple of birds on that, uh, on that bamboo out there. Okay, um, that's, that's part of our lived environment. He talked about the carbon footprint of that environment, but all environments around us are also lived environments. So this is something that we want to try and reconnect with on an individual level, but also on a societal level. So I'll stop there and Thank you. let you. Thank you, great point. I think that point about hope, uh, I mean, it's, we have to take pride. India, we criticize most of the things that uh, the point that you made that the animal human uh, conflict in India, is not as much as we make it out to be, right? They will learn to live together. Yeah, so moving forward, uh, Masood, this session is about hope. How can waste, <laughs> you mentioned that in Delhi, like outside Bangalore, if you see, you have mounds, you see Nandi Hills, where there are huge rocks. You, Delhi, you go out, you see the same thing, but those are made of waste. 70 meter was the, 70 meter tall, waste garbage and you have amazing plans for that. I'm not asking you to explain that plan, we won't have time, but how is your company looking at waste as hope for this country? Yeah, so I think, I think the, 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 the video that you used to, to preface this discussion had the answer there. Every problem has the, the solution hidden in it. The same material that causes environmental degradation, the plastics, what are they? What are plastics? It's, it's crude, it's, it's, it's oil. That's what plastics are. That's where it's, it, it's made from. It's made from Carbon. the same things that we import at a very high cost, you know, in, in dodgy political or geopolitical circumstances from God knows where else. Because we import a significant part of our, 60 to 80 percent of our energy is still imported. Most of our copper, most of our, uh, 100 percent of our rare earth, the so-called lithium batteries that we talk about and all of that is all imported. Our thinking is that those resources which are out there in those mountains of, of, of waste actually represent an opportunity if we prevent them from going there. The same resources, once it is used once, if you can put it back in the manufacturing system as new raw materials, and it is, can be the, the gold and the silver and the platinum and the palladium from the electronic waste, that example that, that Benedict was talking about, or it could be something as mundane as uh, bricks, concrete from a broken house or a renovation project that you're doing. You can recycle that as well. And we must understand, cement has a very high carbon footprint. You cannot decarbonize India if you don't decarbonize construction. You cannot decarbonize, you cannot go green mobility if the steel that you use in your cars and the aluminum that you use is not recycled. So the opportunity to recycle everything, how we approach it is through three very simple mantras. The first one we call integration. We integrate. We don't see waste as this is municipal, this is industrial, this is hospital, this is something else, we integrate. And we see the whole thing as part of the one opportunity. Second is inclusion. Everyone, from school students, to NGOs, to the so-called informal society as part of the solution. And finally, recycle everything. So we call it circularity. So that you take those raw materials and put them back. When you do it at scale, you find it workable. So in, 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 in very simple words, that's the answer. Yeah. I had a chance to visit uh, uh, Masood's factory in, uh, recycling factory in Hyderabad. Uh, I was totally amazed at that. And uh, it's interesting that Hyderabad is one of the cleanest cities uh, because most of its waste is recycled thanks to uh, RE sustainability. Uh, but I asked him, how can Bangalore learn from it? 
and he i think he had politically uh, he wanted to give a politically correct answer but i'll make him answer that question how can bangalore be uh, hyderabad so i think uh, a couple of very interesting decisions have to be taken uh, and the first one is recycling is not a cottage industry as much as we would love it if they could be recycling at household level everywhere it just doesn't make economic sense you need scale and therefore there needs to be a degree of integration as far as making the economics of recycling work the, the first most important message is um, recycling requires scale the second is the polluter has to pay there is no free lunch as far as the environment is concerned that means anyone who is consuming who is producing the waste has to take responsibility for it unfortunately today in the hierarchy of utilities we have just learned how to pay for our electricity water we are still dicey on you know we don't really pay the real resource value of water waste is something way down we we don't really are we not really comfortable paying for that consumption yet so the second big uh, enabler would be if the city takes ownership of its waste and says yes i know i'm if i'm creating an environmental problem i'll pay to solve it i think the civil society in bangalore has a huge challenge they are not putting enough pressure on their corporators on the state government to execute uh, solid waste management projects and other waste management projects i think civil society needs to wake up that's the uh, uh, only way bangalore can improve uh, we have time for just one or two uh, audience questions audience uh, anyone yeah please sir now there is lot of uh, debate going on green hydrogen business uh, so can you just explain how it will be game changer to the this one thank you um yeah i mean it it basically talks about using renewable energy to uh, to produce hydrogen as a clean fuel i mean that's really in in simple terms what green hydrogen is uh, it w it is relevant in certain parts of india where there is uh, and especially uh, if you have the ability to produce offshore or near shore renewable energy and then use it to produce uh, hydrogen through electrolysis for example this is one way in in other parts of india the opportunities are different but uh, we should have a op probably a, a one one discussion about this given that it's a slightly technical topic yeah can we have any of the children asking a question or oh, yeah we'll come to you yeah thanks uh, for the opportunity and uh, my question is like there has to be a behavioral change at human level uh, in order to become more sustainable uh, so uh, will the imp how how we uh, are we going to capture that impact so that there is a behavioral change at every level since waste recycling requires uh, scale for economy but uh, uh, how about changing the behavior of human beings because in europe if we go we see uh, everyone is cautious about wasting the water and every like they don't litter on road so uh, is there any uh, way out or any program for that yeah thanks we'll take one or two more questions quickly so and then we'll give yeah. an answer any more questions um, so this is to masood sir how has the market responded to your initiative because generally eco friendly products are cons uh, considered to be very expensive so how did that happen and to um, avi sir uh, you mentioned that a few forest lands were de declared as waste lands can you mention why that happened briefly i am not aware yeah, we'll take this um so actually forest lands were not declared as waste lands but instead non forest lands have been declared as waste lands and this is a legacy of what the british thought of basically they were common lands they were open ecosystems so they were not because they came from a very colonial they came from the forestry perspective so either land was to be taxed as in it was in in, in private ownership so agriculture was possible there if not taxed then it was forest so you could harvest it for timber 
areas that fl fell in between these were then waste. They were just lying waste because they could not derive any benefit out of it, even though millions of people depended on these, uh, on these areas. Therefore, unfortunately, we continue that legacy for no reason. Um, How can we recover it? That's uh, see, most of these, actually, uh, these landscapes are, are being used even now by people. And uh, one of the main threats to uh, grasslands and open ecosystems is uh, ironically through green energy. Um, because solar power and wind power uh, require sun and they require a lot of space. And where better to put it than in a wasteland? Okay, so, so that's a policy that change that does need to happen. Uh, people are not, uh, you know, we also have a rooftop or a built environment solar policy, but, but large companies tend to prefer these utility scale um, initiatives rather than negotiating with individual uh, landowners and so on. So that's, that's an issue. Just a very quick one on that. Uh, yeah, no, no, so just one very quick comment. Good intentions versus good science. Uh, solar power, first layer is glass, then is silicon, then is copper, then there is a battery. Uh, the, the, the life cycle footprint of all of that should be calculated versus other opportunities that we have to go green. So these, these quick fixes around electric vehicles and solar power need to be, have good science behind it to, make, to take the right decision. This is just one quick comment on that. Behavioral change. Behavioral change actually uh, you know, is, 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 is a way of thinking. Today, recycled products, recovered products are seen as inferior. Somebody talked about recycled products being expensive. Let me tell you. Recycled plastic is sold at a 20-30% discount to Virgin. And the reason is not because the quality is bad. Because there's a perception of poor quality in recycled materials. So, so all I'm trying to say is there needs to be willingness to pay. And that can only, be, that can only come with the consumer demands and says, I, what is the recycled content in this? I want to see recycled content in everything that I consume. The moment the consumer demands it, the behaviors, the, 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 the industry will follow. Uh, on the viability aspect, it's a, it's, 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 the jury is still out there. The fact still remains that our investment was built on a thesis that change will come. And yes, I mean, we have, we have managed to create scale. Um, today, we are successfully recycling 6,000 tons of waste every day. 6,000 tons of waste every day. We recycle. So, so yes, I mean, I mean, but then, I mean, one unicorn in the environmental space, do you think we'll solve the problem? How many of you are going to create a startup in this space? How many of you will become an entrepreneur in this space? The real change will come with 100 people from here, you know, decide that, okay, you know what, this is an opportunity that I'm going to go after. And that will actually create sustainable uh, transformation and, and the decarbonization that we're talking about. Any students? Uh, um, yeah. My question is that, like, uh, it's been saying that the plastic is banned, but uh, even now, like, humans are continuously using plastic, and we can see everywhere that plastic has been used. So is there any perfect solution, like, uh, it should come to the minds of people that uh, plastic is completely banned, and we have to stop using plastic? I'll just give a very quick response to that. I think my voice carries. So plastic is not banned. And actually, again, life cycle decision. Yeah, plastics can be uh, a good choice environmentally as well, as long as you don't throw it. Uh, from an from a, from a overall resource footprint standpoint, if you handle re plastics responsibly, then it actually can be better than, than paper, for example, in many cases. Although you might think paper is more eco-friendly than plastics, yeah? yeah? So again, use science to come to uh, decisions. And, 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 and the second is not just a snapshot of what is the environmental uh, impact, but the life cycle from cradle, not just to the grave, but back to the cradle. What <laughs> is the environmental uh, footprint of a material before you take a decision? Single-use plastic is bad. Single-use plastic is restricted in most parts of the country, banned, so-called banned. Uh, plastics, by, uh, by definition or per se, is not the problem. 
Also, let's not uh, take away responsibility for, from governments and large corporations uh, who continue to um, push against change for all of this. I'm sure you've, you've seen this. There's a huge lobbying. So, you know, they, they, there's, there's a lot of money that's already put behind the use of this. There's a reason we still have chips being sold in these almost non-biotic or non-recyclable uh, packets. It, it's because there's, there's a lot of money put behind those manufacturing systems. And it's up to governments also to enforce this. It's not just individual action, but it has to be uh, okay. action. On that note, I think we are really out of time. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Masood and uh, Avi. Uh, thank you to the audience. We've been pretty excellent. And I'd like to wrap this up with the line that, uh, yes, we have enough reasons to be hopeful. Thank you.